Hello and welcome to our talk, 10 lessons on life and writing from Jane Austen, in which we'll discuss how the life and works of Jane Austen inspire and encourage us all to chase our dreams. I'm Jessica Bull and I live in London and I write historical mysteries. Hello and I'm Elizabeth Welke from Toronto, Canada. I write Regency Romance as Felicity George. We're really excited to be taking part in Virtual Jane Con, a radically inclusive event for fans of Jane Austen. Austen has been a huge influence on my imagination ever since that fateful day in 1995 when my mum told me that there was a new series on TV called Pride and Prejudice and would I like to come and watch it with her. I didn't like it, I loved it. The next day, I asked my English teacher about Jane Austen. He gave me a copy of Northanger Abbey, and that's it. I was a Janeite for life. But it wasn't until 2020 that I realised how much I relied upon the works of Jane Austen. When the pandemic hit, I'd just been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, and my daughter was on the pathway to being diagnosed with autistic spectrum disorder. When the world shut down, our routines were disrupted and our wider support network disappeared overnight. I remember feeling incredibly isolated. To cheer myself up, I started buying more books and listening to more podcasts about Jane Austen. Not just her novels, but also her life. And it was realising how hard Austen has struggled to write, which inspired me to start writing fiction again. If she could do it, with little hope of being published, moving from home to home, writing in longhand, and even brewing her own ink, then what was my excuse? And it's writing plus connecting with other Jane Austen fans all over the world, which has really helped to keep me sane over the last couple of years. When I was 16 years old, my mum, who was also my high school librarian, handed me a copy of Pride and Prejudice when I was hanging out, bored, in the library after school waiting for her to be ready to go home. I opened it up and I couldn't put it down. From the moment Darcy entered the assembly rooms in Meryton, I was hooked. Would Elizabeth marry this tall, dark, handsome, rich man, so proud, so snobby, so undeniably smoking hot? I became a devoted Janeite from that day. I couldn't have known it then as a 16 year old, as yet relatively untouched by tragedy. But two years later, when both my brother and my father died, it would be Jane's books and film adaptations of her works, which I would turn to over and over again for comfort. Jane could conjure a smile in me, even through the most difficult tears. And I know I'm not alone in thanking Miss Austen for being a light in the darkest times of my life. And it's because we know that many of you will find the same comfort and solace in Jane Austen's work that we particularly wanted to share our top 10 Jane Austen lessons in life and writing. Instead of analysing Austen's six complete novels, which I'm sure you already know and love, we're going to look at her letters and other writing to see what she has to teach us. And number one is No One Does It Alone. Austin was born into an incredibly loving and supportive literary family. Her father, the Reverend Mr. George Austin, was a clergyman and a schoolmaster. He owned over 500 books, all of which Jane had uncensored access to, including some that were rather risque. Mr. Austin was the first to see the brilliance of her work. He was so confident in her early draft of Pride and Prejudice, or First Impressions, as it was called then, that when she was only 21, he submitted it to Lord Byron's publisher. Unfortunately, they sent it back unread. What a sweetheart he was for trying. Austen's mother, Mrs. Cassandra Austen, was a very witty poet, something you can see in, this, in the following adorable mother and daughter collaboration written to cheer up Martha Lloyd. Martha was Jane's dear friend, and she lived with the Austen women at Chawton. At the time this poem was written, Martha had suffered a bereavement and was waiting for her morning clothes to be made up. Lines sent to an uncivil dressmaker by Jane Austen. Miss Lloyd has now sent to Miss Green, as opening the box may be seen, some yards of a black 
ploughman's gauze to be made up directly because Miss Lloyd must in mourning appear for the death of a relative dear. Miss Lloyd must expect to receive this license to mourn and to grieve. Complete ere the end of the week, it is better to write than to speak. Mrs. Cassandra Austin's reply to Miss Green. I've often made clothes for those who write prose, but tis the first time I've had orders in rhyme. Depend on it, fair maid, you shall be obeyed. Your garment of black shall sit close to your back, and in every part I will exert my art. It shall be the neatest and eke the completest that ever was seen, or my name is not green. James' eldest brother, James, was an accomplished writer and poet. He even started his own literary review, The Loiterer, with a younger brother, Henry, while they were both studying at the University of Oxford. And it's thanks to Henry that Jane was published at all. He acted as her literary agent before the term was even invented by using his army contacts to get his younger sister into print. Thus, the first editions of Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice were, bizarrely, published by Thomas Egerton's Military Library. We can't all be blessed by boy being born into such a family, but thankfully, we do have the world at our fingertips in a way that Jane Austen never did. So if you dream of writing, get out there, get online, and find people who will support you and who you will support in return. The Twitter, um, sorry, the Twitter writing community is a great place to start. Or try joining a virtual or online writing class and swapping pages with the other students. It truly takes a village to write a novel. No one does it alone. Number two is give yourself permission to take your writing seriously. Perhaps because her family placed such value in artistic pursuits, Austin had no trouble taking her writing seriously. When she was only a teenager, her father gave her an extravagant and expensive gift of three vellum notebooks, into which Jane inscribes her early work, now known as the Juvenalia. She has the most wonderful ability to be simultaneously proud of her achievements while maintaining her characteristically irreverent tone about her subject matter. One of the gems in this collection is her hilarious spoof textbook. A History of England from the Reign of Henry IV to the Death of Charles I by a partial, prejudiced and ignorant historian. There will be very few dates in this history. Austin continues with a witty rundown of the monarchs, poking fun at everything from the rumours about James I's same-sex lovers to her own preference for the Catholic religion. Quite daring for the daughter of an Anglican minister. She tasked her elder sister, Cassandra, with illustrating the history with caricatures based on family members. There is even speculation that Cassandra's drawing of Mary, Queen of Scots, might be a young Jane Austen herself. So approach your writing as you would any other hobby. You wouldn't feel embarrassed about learning an instrument or a new language. If it's important to you, that's enough to make it important. Most of us who write do it because we simply can't not do it. Share your work. I know this is terrifying at first, but start with a trusted friend. Honestly, most writers will tell you not to start with a spouse whom you know will be gentle and the first time sharing is the hardest. Every time after that will be easier. Silence any little haters who live in your head and believe in yourself. Your words have value. Your stories are important. People need to hear them. Number three, it's not all about the money. It's true that Austin was deeply concerned with money. As a woman of the middle classes, her own financial situation was precarious. Social convention barred her from going out and earning a living as her brothers could. And yet, after her father died, she was never quite well off enough to be independent. Here's an extract from Austin's letter to her niece, where she jokes about her own want of money while discussing the possibility of a second print run of Mansfield Park. Letter to Fanny Knight, November 
1814. We are to see Egerton today when it will probably be determined. People are more ready to borrow and praise than to buy, which I cannot wonder, wonder at. But though I like praise as well as anybody, I like what Edward calls pewter too. In her lifetime, women of Austin's rank were expected to obtain financial security through marriage. And it's confronting the harsh reality of this dilemma, whether to marry for love or for money, or to remain single and penniless, which is at the heart of Austin's works. By making it clear that a young woman did have a choice in this endeavour, and even had the right to refuse a financially savvy proposal, Austin was doing something really quite radical. As fellow writer W.H. Auden points out, W.H. Auden's lines about Jane Austen from his poem, Letter to Lord Byron. You could not shock her more than she shocks me. Beside her, Joyce seems innocent as grass. It makes me uncomfortable to see an English spinster of the middle class describe the amorous effects of brass, reveal so frankly and with such sobriety the economic basis of society. Austin clearly understood the way her world worked and that the easiest and most socially acceptable way for her to achieve financial stability was to marry. And yet, the evidence suggests she made the most radical choice of all, remaining single in order to maintain her freedom to write. You probably know about the Big Wither Affair. It's the most awkward anecdote in literary history, whereby Jane said yes to a proposal from the younger brother of her dear friends, Harris Big Wither, only to get cold feet overnight and have to go through the excruciating agony of retracting it in the morning. But Harris Bigwither wasn't her only suitor. She also appears to have turned down clergyman Edward Br Bridges, Jane's brother-in-law, through marriage. And Austin's publisher once spent an entire carriage ride trying to muster up the nerve to propose to her. And the Prince Regent's librarian was so enchanted with her, he painted the most beautiful portrait after meeting her only once. Men were queuing up to marry Jane Austen. And why not? It's been over 200 years and we're all still madly in love with her. But she declined all of these offers, choosing to remain dependent on her family and earn what she could by her pen instead. There are easier ways to make money than writing fiction. But if you really want to do it, don't let that put you off. The satisfaction of developing your craft and writing a story that readers will enjoy will be its own reward. Number four, know your market. In Austin's time, books were very expensive, the equivalent of around 300 pounds for a bound edition. She overcame this by being a great supporter of circulating libraries, subscribing to the local library wherever she traveled. Here's a note to her sister, where she talks about a new, new library opening in nearby Basingstoke. The Mary she refers to is her great frenemy, Martha Lloyd's younger sister, Mary. Mary went on to become Austin's sister-in-law when she married James. To Cassandra Austin, 19th of December, 1798. I have received a very civil note from Mrs. Martin requesting my name as a subscriber to her library, which opens on the 14th of January. And my name, or rather yours, is accordingly given. My mother finds the money. Mary subscribes too, which I am glad of, but hardly expected. As an inducement to subscribe, Mrs. Martin tells us that her collection is not only to consist of novels, but of every kind of literature, etc., etc. She might have spared this pretension to our family, who are great novel readers and not ashamed of being so. But it was necessary, I suppose, to the self-consequence of half of her subscribers. In Austen's day, the novel was a brand new art form, dismissed by critics as lightweight and feminine. But she had no pretensions about literature. She was simply hungry for stories. If you want to be a writer, you need to be a reader. Read widely what people are um, writing in your genre and outside of it. But most of all, don't let anyone make you feel ashamed 
of what you read. Number five, know your genre. Austen is the absolute queen of what in her day was known as the courtship novel. As we've touched on, she was so good at this format that she used it to advance opinions which would have been deeply controversial to her contemporaries. In Jane Austen, The Secret Radical by Dr. Helen Kelly, she argues that Pride and Prejudice advances the argument for the overthrow of the English aristocracy by the new breed of meritocrats which Austen's family belonged to, and that Mansfield Park is a vehicle for exposing the Anglican Church's complicity in transatlantic slavery. Whether you agree with Dr. Kelly or not, it's clear that Austen knew she was writing within certain restrictions and that by doing so, she could achieve more than by stepping outside the conventions of genre. Here's a letter she wrote to her nephew, Edward, the son of Brother James and Frenemy Mary. Encouraged by his aunt, Edward grew up to be a fellow writer. To James Edward Austin, December 1816. By the by, my dear Edward, I am quite concerned for the loss that your mother mentions in her letter. Two chapters and a half to be missing is monstrous. It is well that I have not been at Steventon lately and therefore cannot be suspected of purloining them. Two strong twigs and a half towards a nest of my own would have been something. But I do not think that any theft of that sort would be really very well for me. What do I do with your strong, manly, spirited sketches full of variety and glow? How could I possibly join them onto the little bit, two inches wide, of ivory on which I work with so fine a brush, which produces little effect after so much labor? It's this, Edward, we have to thank for the first biography of Jane Austen, which drew on the family remembrances of her and for compiling and conserving what was left of her papers. This comment by Jane Austen is sometimes taken out of context as, her, as evidence of her modesty. But as ever with Jane, when you look at it closely, you realise that she's having the last laugh. Two inches of ivory of what are what miniatures, the tiny portraits which were wildly popular in Austen's day, are painted onto. A miniaturist is a highly specialist artist. It takes an incredibly keen eye and absolute skill and mastery to create a good miniature. It's arguably more difficult than a big manly oil painting. So far from being restrictive, knowing the conventions and techniques and genre fiction can actually give you the freedom to be more creative. To break rules, you have to know the rules. Number six, many drafts make great work. People used to say that Jane Austen had two distinct periods of writing. In her late teens and early twenties when she lived at Steventon and in later life when she moved to Chawton and the years in between were seen as a creative wilderness in which she didn't write a word. Now, we think it's more complicated than that. Austin very likely spent those years revising her earlier works and starting new projects which were interrupted, such as The Watsons, a story about a family of women grieving for their dead clergyman patriarch, which became too close to the bone after Austin's own father died. Northanger Abbey and Persuasion were never published in Austin's lifetime because in her mind, they weren't finished. Both were on the shelf, as she put it. It was Henry and Cassandra who decided to publish these works after Austen's death. And thank goodness they did. Although I think she would probably have been mortified to find these drafts on sale, as it's clear she refined her work. Here's a letter where Austen is excitedly telling her sister about the arrival of the first editions of Pride and Prejudice which was published in three volumes. To Cassandra, January 1813. I want to tell you that I have got my own darling child from London. The second volume is shorter than I could wish, but the difference is not so much in reality as in look, there being a larger proportion of narrative in that part. I have lopped and cropped 
so successfully, however, that I imagine it to be rather shorter than Sense and Sensibility. We also know from Austin's comments about Sanderton that she sketched out her novels in advance, although sadly we don't have any documentary evidence to support this. Most of writing is planning and revising in the same way that most of being a musician is practicing. Great stories are born in the edit. What makes this bearable is sharing your work with other writers who can help you develop and who don't mind reading the same section six times and giving you feedback, usually because they know you'll do the same for them. Number seven. Number seven, learn how to handle feedback. There's no getting away from it. Sharing your work with others is terrifying. As much as we want constructive feedback, we're all secretly hoping to be told it's the best thing the reader has ever read. And by the way, here's the details of my agent. But in reality, writing is a lengthy and collaborative process, especially at a professional level. So it's really important you develop a thick skin and learn how to appraise feedback dispassionately. Austin would gauge her readers' reactions to her stories by reading her drafts out loud to her close circle of family and friends. Apparently, she was a very accomplished performer of her own work. She also knew how to take criticism in the well-meaning spirit it was offered. Here's an extract where she pokes fun at all of the plot ideas that friends and acquaintances have thrown her way. Plan of a novel according to hints from various quarters, 1816. Wherever the heroine goes, somebody falls in love with her, and she receives repeated off offers of marriage, which she refers wholly to her father, exceedingly angry that he should not be applied to first. She is often carried away by the anti-hero, but rescued either by her father or by the hero. She is often reduced to support herself and her father by her talents and work for her bread. She is continually cheated and defrauded of her hire, worn down to a skeleton, and now and then starved to death. At last, hunted out of civilized society, denied the poor shelter of the humblest cottage, they are compelled to retreat to Kamchatka, where the poor father, quite worn down, finding his end approaching, throws himself on the ground and after four or five hours of tender advice and parental admonition to his miserable child, expires in a fine burst of literary enthusiasm. It's such a shame that Austin's family trimmed the edges of this document, destroying the origins of all these hints, which no doubt would have added to Austin's biting wit. So always let feedback settle so you can appraise it with a cool head rather than with a bruised heart. Don't worry too much about the mechanics like grammar and spelling. Some people are great at spotting those things and others are not. Focus instead, instead on what people think of the story. Seek feedback from the right quarters. Find someone who challenges but also encourages you. Eight. Make it a habit. It's no coincidence that Austin's most successful and productive periods of writing coincided with the times when her domestic situation was most stable. In her late teens and early twenties, when she lived at Stevenson Rectory, she and Cassandra shared a bedroom so they could maintain a private dressing room next door where Jane could write and practice her, her piano forte in peace. In the latter period of Austin's life, when she settled at Chawton Cottage with her mother, sister and Martha Lloyd, she was able to develop a strict routine. If you visit Chawton, you can see her tiny writing table and imagine her hard at work. Writing requires discipline. You can't wait for the mood to strike you. As Austin put it in a letter to her sister. To Cassandra Austin, October 1813. I am not at all in a humor for writing. I must write on until I am. You've probably heard the old adage of write every day. Well, that's not possible for all of us. There is real benefit in having a set routine for your writing. Coming back to the same piece, for example, when you're forced to submit something to your writing group once a month, builds momentum and flexes the creative part of your brain. 
having a loyal reader or critique partner who is always eager for the next installment in your story or novel can be a wonderful incentive as well. Number nine, make space for your art. Following on from the last point about routine, writing is a time consuming hobby. Us writers can spend hours, days, frowning at a blank page. In her years at Chawton, the household of women rallied around Jane, protecting her precious writing time. They recognised that if she was to produce her novels, there would be other things that she couldn't do. And it's because of their labour that we have those great masterpieces. As Austin says about contemporary authoress Mrs Jane West. To Cassandra Austin, September 1816. And how good Mrs. West could have written such books and collected so many hard works, words, sorry, with all of her family cares is still more a matter of astonishment. Composition seems to me impossible with a head full of mutton and doses of rhubarb. Ask yourself, what are you prepared to let slide in exchange for making progress in your writing? It might be watching TV or you might not be able to say yes to every social occasion. Or you might have to give up having a spotlessly tidy home or neatly ironed clothes. To prevent burnout, give yourself permission to prioritize what's important to you. Number 10, finally, don't give up. Austin had a full start to her career as a published author in 1803 when publishers Crosby & Co bought the copyright of Susan, which we think was an early version of Northanger Abbey. They advertised the work as soon to be published in a catalogue, but never printed it. Six years later, in 1809, Austin's patience had worn thin. In a peak of indignation, she dashed off a letter to the publisher under a rather fitting pseudonym. Gentlemen, in the spring of the year 1803, a manuscript novel in two volumes entitled Susan was sold to you by a gentleman of the name of Seymour and the purchase money of 10 pounds received at the same time. Six years have since passed and this work of which I avow I am the authoress has never to the best of my knowledge appeared in print, though an early publication was stipulated for at the time of the sale. I can only account for such an extraordinary circumstance by supposing that the manuscript by some carelessness has been lost. And if that was the case, I am willing to supply you with another copy if you are disposed to avail yourselves of it and will engage for no farther delay when it comes into your hands. Should no notice be taken of this, I shall feel myself at liberty to secure the publication of my work by applying elsewhere. I am gentlemen, etc., etc., mad. Mrs. Ashton Dennis. Infuriatingly for Austin, the letter didn't work. Pompous Crosby replied to say he did still have the manuscripts and was under no obligation to publish it, and that if Austin, slash mad, tried selling it to another publisher, then he'd sue her. However, she could buy the copyright back for what he'd paid for it. But as I told you earlier, it's Jane Austen who gets the last laugh. In 1816, after her other works had been published to wide acclaim, she did buy that copyright back for the original sum of £10. And it was only after the copyright was safe in her position that she let the publisher know that Susan was by the very same authoress as the literary sensations, Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice. Everyone faces rejection. If you love to write, keep writing. More than that, keep learning, keep developing. Keep making friends and connections in the writing community. You never know where it might lead. Really hope that you've enjoyed our lessons on life and writing from Miss Jane Austen. She has so much to teach us, not only through her works, but also through her extraordinary resilience and the way she chose to live her life on her own terms. And if our talk has inspired you to find out more about Jane Austen's life, then here are some of our favourite book recommendations. There's Jane Austen's Letters, collected and edited by Deirdre Le Fay, Jane Austen A Life by Claire Tomalin, 
Jane Austen at Home by Lucy Worsley, The Real Jane Austen, A Life in Small Things by Paula Byrne, and Jane Austen, The Secret Radical by Helena Kelly. Although I must point out, if we've made any historical inaccuracies in this talk, they're down to us, not these authors. <laughs> and lastly, please stay in touch. Let us know what you've learned from Jane Austen, either in the comments below or by tweeting us with the hashtag virtualjanecon. You can find me, Jessica Bull, on Twitter at Novelist Jessica or on Instagram at Novelist Jessica Bull. And you can find me, Felicity George, pen name of Elizabeth Welke, on Twitter at Felicity George at Elizabeth Welke or on Facebook, um, Felicity George Author. My books are going to take a little while yet to make it onto the shelves. But if you love swoon-worthy Regency romance, which is both rich in historical detail and piping hot, then Felicity George's debut, A Lady's Risk, is, a la is available for pre-order from publisher Orion Dash or wherever you buy your books online. Thank you so much for joining us. We both love to talk about Jane Austen and about writing, and you can usually find us on Twitter, especially when we're meant to be writing. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.